have a, a panel with some excellent panelists. Kara Wilbur is gonna be announcing the panelists shortly. We're gonna be taking lots of questions from everyone on the call. And hopefully if we have time, um, I'm going to show people how to use some of the tools that are online to figure out where you can build one of these, what you can build. Um, and we'll do that in real time. We've had a, a, few, a few people volunteer their properties very graciously. So we're gonna look at their properties um, live. And one of the properties was very, very interesting. And we're gonna have a little competition. So if you have a pen, um, you're gonna wanna write down this address. And the address is 23 Pitt Street in, of course, Portland, Maine. And the competition, this is going to be one of the properties that we, we look at at the end of the call after the panel. And the competition is to figure out how many, how many full dwelling units can this homeowner build on this parcel. And um, we're going to pick from whomever can get the right answer and they're going to get a free sweatshirt that we'll, that we'll send out. So as you are listening to the call, feel free to, to try to research that answer, pull up the zoning bylaw, pull up some of the tools online, do everything you know how to do, and private message the number of units um, in, the, in the chat to Alexis, who's gonna be moderating. And I'm looking forward to see what people come up with. It's gonna be fun, because we're, we're hopefully gonna give you the answer by the end of the call tonight. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kara, who's gonna announce our panelists and talk about what, what we're gonna talk in the panel. Kara, I'm gonna flip it to you. Hi everybody, thanks for coming and for interest and energy around housing in Portland. Um, I'm with EMB Portland, which is an advocacy organization um, that's working to uh, make Portland a more sustainable, liv livable, equitable, walkable place. Um, you can find information on the organization at www.embportlandme.com. Um, and get involved. Um, there's a lot of great work happening in the city and it's an exciting time um, to be here. So um, with that, I'm going to just do a quick uh, intro of the panelists. We have Kim Cook with us, um, who's the former city councilor who fought for an expanded public process for the recode phase one, which allowed the community to engage in an in-depth deep dive of ADUs um, and her work on that and championing, championing changes uh, to the ADU standards um, through the council process resulted in, like Chris said, one of um, our nation's best ADU policies. Uh, we also have Matt Grooms, who is a senior planner with the city of Portland, um, who crafted the beautifully succinct, clear language on ADUs and has been a champion for ADUs and, and creative approaches to housing. Um, in the city of Portland. So glad that we can have um, a rep from Portland uh, involved in this conversation and thanks for all that work. Um, and then Chris introduced himself, but uh, I think the, the timing of the, the ADU um, rules and uh, Chris's appearance in our, our, our greater Portland region is really exciting. Um, and it, it's great to have that expertise um, in knowing how to uh, move these forward. Uh, Alexis is also um, with us and she's with Backyard ADU's um, marketing and AV. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Alexis who's gonna just explain the process for um, questions and uh, get right into the, the Q&A. Thanks. Hi everybody. Um, I am going to be doing the moderation, uh, as Kara said. Um, if you have any questions, can you please use the Q&A function opposed to the chat? If you do put it in the chat, I'll ask, but it is much easier to use the Q&A function and you're much more likely to get your question answered. Also, if your question is directed at a specific panelist, please put their name at the beginning or at the end. If not, I'm just gonna give it to the person that it makes the most sense to me. And those are the housekeeping things. Um, so to start it off, I have my first question is for Kim. Um, Portland has been doing an awesome job of advocating for ADUs. What made you identify this as part of the solution to Portland's housing shortage? 
Thanks, and I appreciate the invitation to be part of the panel tonight. Um, you know, I, when I ran for council back in 2017, the full process of redoing Portland zoning code uh, was uh, planned and, and starting to get underway. And uh, one of my priority changes, although we have a lot of changes to make uh, in Portland, uh, was to reform the ADU uh, ordinance, uh, piece of the zoning ordinance. And we had um, uh, very restrictive, what I consider to be a very restrictive ADU ordinance. And it was really standing in the way uh, for folks to create ADUs, whether those be uh, separate dwelling units uh, in a backyard or they be within an existing uh, structure. So um, through the course of phase one, uh, the uh, we got, we had uh, ADUs included in that phase of the recode. Uh, and over the course of three years, uh, working with uh, the planning staff and the planning board, we're able to um, pass uh, changes, which I'm glad to hear folks from who have looked at other zoning ordinances uh, characterize this one as uh, forward thinking. Um, so it really, it comes down to uh, the importance of adding housing. Uh, and infill development within the city of Portland. And uh, the city unfortunately has not been growing in population even though our broader area has been growing. And uh, there is a severe shortage of units and um, ADUs is just one of those tools as we all know uh, that can help uh, in addressing the shortage of on the supply side. And uh, certainly it's not the only initiative that um, the Portland City Council and, and the staff um, have been working on over many years. Uh, but I think it is one important tool. And, and so that's why I think it was included uh, in phase one and why I think the council saw fit at the end of the process to make significant amendments to uh, go even further. Wonderful. Um, my next question is for Matt. Uh, how many ADUs would the city like to see built in order to consider this a successful housing initiative? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and we, I think, I think a simple answer is we don't have a definitive number in mind that we're trying to construct. Um, you know, as as Councillor Cook mentioned, we noted that there were significant hurdles with the old regulations around ADUs, and that they had actually. You know, we had people coming to us on a regular basis saying that there were issues with permitting these. There were issues with, you know, things related to fire code and, and, and actually getting these constructed. And so we, in this effort, we really tried to take, take ADU provisions back to the studs and really create a new comprehensive set of uh, rules around them that would make them much, much easier to develop and to allow them in more areas of the city than they had previously been allowed and to allow a variety of different forms, such as you know, units that were you know, are eternal to a building uh, in an addition as, an, as a detached structure and an existing accessory structure. Um, we just, we really wanted to open up the policy as a whole. And so, you know, if you look at the city's comprehensive plan, we have very clear cut goals about you know, where we see our population being in 2030. You know, we see, we're a city of 67,000 people, give or take, and we're, we're you know, our goal is to have 72,000 people calling Portland home by that. Uh, we have a similar goal around housing production. We want to see 2,500 uh, plus new units come online within that same time period. You know, how much of that is composed of ADUs? We, we don't really have a, a, you know, a clear sense of what's the right number, what's not the right number. Um, just for context, over the last five years or so, we've seen, you know, probably not even two dozen ADUs citywide being developed. And so clearly we wanna see a notable uptick from there. Um, and I think, you know, as with any good policy, we're gonna be looking to collect feedback from people who are attempting to build ADUs and understanding where hurdles exist, even with our new policy and what we can do to continue to facilitate uh, development of, of new ADUs. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, my next question goes to Chris. 
What are the most common barriers people should be prepared to encounter when planning their backyard home or ADU? Great question. And just to kind of piggyback off of uh, Kim and Matt, it's not going to be Portland zoning bylaw. It's, uh, it's, it's certainly not going to be. Um, and, and really what, from what we've seen doing this, uh, the, major, the majority of people who go about building an ADU are doing it for family. And, and I think the biggest challenge is convincing, whether it's a, talking to an aging parent about downsizing, um, not necessarily, and again, especially in Portland, because the ADU bylaw is so clear and these are by right, um, you, you can probably build what you wanna build. I mean, it really just comes down to the family dynamics if, if you're building one of these for, uh, for consolidating households. Um, and then honestly, and this is extremely unfortunate, but uh, the affordability factor. Um, everybody knows that cost of construction was high before COVID-19. Um, and then with material shortages, it, it continues to go up. And um, that said, the benefits of, of building these in backyards, at least connecting utilities and site work is significantly less expensive from new construction. Um, and, and often, especially in greater Portland, uh, you can probably build a small ADU for less than you can buy a condo or a new house, just given how much how much prices have been pushed up by um, locals, but also as we've all seen, people flooding in from from out of state with with much higher purchasing powers, which which is part of growing Maine and a good thing, but but also something that that we need to to deal with um, in terms of creating more housing. So. Certainly back, it, it's certainly the family dynamics, figuring out how to do it when it makes sense and, and making sure that um, everyone's gonna get what they want when, when you're living on one lot. All right, thank you so much. Kim, sometimes people have concerns about increased population density in traditionally single family zones when ADUs are built. What do you have to say about this? How will this affect Portland neighborhoods? You know, I, I guess what I would say is uh, folks may have some concerns if a neighbor adds a, an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I often see uh, any change uh, create concerns among, among neighbors, uh, whether it's a commercial use or uh, residential uses or whatever the, the change might be. But um, I think for each, um, each household, if they think about whether they would want the opportunity to be able to move in a loved one, uh, whether that be an adult child or um, an aging parent, uh, or be able to add on um, as they age in place because they might want the rental income to help pay their property tax bill. Um, I think if they make it personal to themselves, they'll realize that you know adding a, a adding housing within residential zones. Um, is not um, a threat to the public's health, safety, and welfare. And, you know, I uh, always uh, look at regulations, municipal state regulations are, are based on uh, the police power under the constitution, which says that the government can, can regulate uh, to protect the public's health, welfare, and safety. Uh, and so at the end of the day, um, allowing uh, property owners to add uh, dwelling units in residential zones does not at all um, uh, impact negatively the health, welfare, or safety of um, the community. In fact, I think arguably, it's very arguable, and, um, and in my opinion, absolutely true that it increases our welfare when we have uh, enough housing units. So, you know, I think change is always hard, uh, but most of Portland. Um, already has a mix of residential units. I, I live in an off peninsula neighborhood, Deering Center, and on the block that I live in, which was built around the 1900 turn of the century, um, there are three unit buildings on our block, two unit buildings, single family homes, it's all mixed together. Um, and it's one of a, a very desirable neighborhood. So, you know, I think as people do this, um, any fear that folks might have uh, will be uh, taken care of as they have new neighbors. 
Thank you so much. Our next question is going to be directed towards Matt. Um, does Portland allow these structures to be Airbnb, like you can a room in your house, or would it have to be attached? So um, when you say Airbnb, do you mean, are you saying that uh, are these allowed for short-term rentals or? Yes. Okay. That's how I interpret the question. Right. So we do not allow um, for these units to be occupied as short-term rentals with, and so that, that is one uh, unique caveat to, to this type of uh, unit. So if they are to be rented out, they're to be rented out for long-term renters or, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Chris, let's see. Um, you have been focused on attached ADUs instead of the traditional attached in-law apartment. Why is that? Um, it's really a couple of reasons and it, uh, the first is they're, they're easier to build than trying to connect to an existing, an existing home, especially in New England, where so many of the homes are, are very old, very few of them are level and plumb infrastructure is old. It, it creates a very difficult engineering and just boots on the ground building challenge to try to connect into that or convert space. Um, bringing those buildings up to code is, is not easy. But the, the primary reason why we love detached ADUs and we're, we're huge advocates for them, and, and especially any town we say detached ADUs that really need to be allowed, um, is because it's what people want. Uh, people love the tiny home on wheels movement because it's a separate structure. Not necessarily because it's on wheels. I think there's a large group of people that like the idea that they can be moved. But the, the key is it's a little home. And a lot of people think of a home as having its own front door, um, maybe a little bit of grass. And especially in Maine, someone who lives in Maine is here because there's space and um, not everybody loves big apartment, apartment buildings. So the detached ADU allows you to do that. It allows you to, to, to put a small house in a backyard um, and even for family. Um, it, this may surprise some people on the call, it, it may not, but when we're talking to families, they don't want to live under the same roof. Um, when parents are moving back into their kids, into their kids' backyards, they want a little bit of grass in between each other. They, they want to be neighbors, they don't want to be roommates. Um, and that goes both for the, uh, both generations, the, the kids who own the house that may be having their parents move in the backyard or even the other way. We've actually seen it go both ways where uh, kids are moving back into their parents' yards and building small houses because they just can't afford to buy anything in the current market, which makes a lot of sense because when the entry price for a home is over $400,000, there's not a lot of people that can afford that. But yeah, detached ADUs, it, it, it's close, but not too close in, in the eyes of the, the people we've been talking Thank you. Matt, the next question is for you. Um, people are wondering, do all of the requirements, setbacks, uh, property sizes, all of those things need to be met if you're renovating a pre-existing structure like a garage? Yeah, so the answer would be yes. You can occupy an existing, and, and let me st take a step back from that. So you can occupy an existing accessory structure that does not meet zoning as an ADU. The main thing to note here is that you cannot exacerbate any element of nonconformity having to do with that structure. So you could not add on to a garage, for example, and bring it even closer to the property line. That would not be allowed. However, if it, if it is an existing structure, we, we do have provisions in place in our code that do allow for its reuse. You do not need to tear down and reconstruct something that needs zoning. It can be in that existing structure. Hey Matt, can, we, can you build up as well? Like, could you put a second floor on a garage? You can so long as you are still under that, um, the height limit for accessory structures, which I think is 18 feet. Um, but you, if it's if you can build up to that 
point, then yeah, you are more than welcome to. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of people ask about that. Can you, can you convert a garage or build a second floor in a garage? That's not yeah. conforming as many are. And it's worth noting too, uh, when I say 18 feet, so the way we measure height in the city is, is by, it depends on the roof form. So in a lot of cases, you know, 18 feet may sound like it's prohibitive, but uh, you can, in a lot of cases, get a two-story building in under 18 feet. I, I would just add that there's uh, one other limitation um, in um, subsection nine and the accessory dwelling units that uh, also, if it's a separate structure from the primary structure, that the um, accessory dwelling unit structure can't be higher, you know, have a height that's higher than uh, the primary. So if you have a ranch and, and then want to do a two a two story in back of it. I don't know that that would, uh, that would work. So there's a, there's a couple of nuances there and it kind of was meant to ensure that um, if you do have a detached structure that it doesn't, it is still accessory to the primary structure. It doesn't dwarf, right? So you're not putting, you're, you're not building um, a two story building in the backyard of a small ranch, right? That would kind of really look out of character. So there was, there was a couple of pieces in here that could limit that, but um, um, the, the staff at, will be able to work through all those details. In the same line of conversation, I think there's a couple of questions here. Um, people asking to just get a, an overview of what the, the rules allow. So it seems like um, that'd be a good one for you to try to tackle that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so, um, so the rules allow for any residential development. So this does not mean, you know, it does not need to be a property that is zoned residential, but any property that has use as either single, two family or multifamily development has the right uh, to construct up to two accessory dwelling units. Um, there are, so in large part, those units would be subject to the underlying zoning for whatever zone you're in. And in part, that was because we had a real desire to see that these units uh, fit into their context. We wanted to make sure that we were not, you know, creating what looked like major new multifamily development in an area that only allows single family development, for example. So we wanted to make sure that setbacks were still met. We wanted to make sure that uh, things such as um, lot coverage, uh, were still being met so that those sites in and of themselves functioned very similarly to how other properties on, on you know, a given street or in a neighborhood would function. Um, that said, we did relax the lot area per dwelling unit requirements uh, so that any new accessory dwelling unit is not required to meet the lot area per dwelling unit requirements. And that's essentially how we calculate density in the city. Um, so for example, in the R6 zone, it's, you know, there is a lot area per dwelling unit requirement of 725 square feet per unit. So if you have a 4,000 square foot lot, you can get up to five units under the base zoning. However, if you were to add in these accessory dwelling units, assuming that you meet the other provisions, you could essentially get up to seven units and those last two units would not count towards, um, towards that, that density requirement. A couple other things to note would be that there are, as uh, Councillor Cook mentioned, there are some minimal design requirements around these. So uh, the units themselves need to be um, subordinate in nature and placement to the principal structure. So whether that be set back in the backyard, they need to be, you know, detached or, or excuse me, if they are attached, they need to read as an addition onto the building, not so much as you know, a second unit in and of itself um, to really kind of carry forward that, that concept of this being a single family neighborhood or, a, or a, a neighborhood that allows for two family or multifamily, but not, you know, completely changing the nature of, of the built form. Um, other things to note would be that um, there is a, there is, let me actually look at that really quickly. Um, that the units themselves are restricted in terms of their size. So they need to be less than two thirds the square footage of the principal unit. Uh, they need to be 
at least one of the units on site need to be occupied by the owner of the property at the time that the accessory dwelling unit is developed. And that, um, that all of the units need to remain under common ownership. So you can't, for example, subdivide the lot or, or you know, sell one of the units as a, as a condominium. And I think that, that more or less covers it. Thank you. Um, Chris, a question for you. Um, many people in the audience may be actively considering building an ADU and have seen that construction costs are going up. How does that affect your prices and construction costs in general? Yeah, good question. I think it's the hard ones. Um, so what we, everybody knows that the cost of construction is just too high. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons the cost of rent is too high. It's one of the reasons that mortgages have gone too high. Um, and, and when we started working on backyard ADUs, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons we started doing it was to create more high quality units, specifically rental units at prices that people could actually afford. Um, over the last year, we've seen, as we've been trying to find ways to um, bring the cost down um, through offsite construction techniques, uh, different types of foundations, um, streamlining utility connections, we, we've seen material prices triple, um, which, which I, really nobody has, has a good answer for it. it luckily in the, um, in the offsite, in the offsite manufacturing space or modular factories or, or any company that's doing a lot of scale, uh, they've been lucky enough to have more pricing power over the cost of two by fours and plywood and flooring. And we've seen a, luckily we've seen a smaller increase in modular housing than we've seen in um, the cost of materials at say a, a local lumber shop. Um, and again, it just comes down to purchasing power and, and their ability to, um, to basically negotiate prices down. Now that's also that's always good and bad. I mean, Maine's got a local modular factory, uh, KBS, out of uh, South Paris, um, so they probably benefited from it, from seeing prices stay a little bit level. There's one in New Hampshire. There's uh, tiny homes of Maine. I don't. I, I think they've got some decent buying power, but um, but anyway, so it, it continues to go up, and it's it's affecting everybody negatively. Uh, and I, I I touched on this earlier. I think one of the most important things about accessory dwelling units and building homes and backyards is the base price to build these is less than building on a fresh lot because generally you're, you're able to use existing infrastructure. Um, often you can tie into existing plumbing instead of uh, getting a permit to cut into a street and having to repair a sidewalk, which is very expensive. That's kind of in flux in Portland right now. There's a lot of conversation around that. It's something that, that we're gonna be working on over the next month to get clarity on. Um, but even things like electric, um, it, it's a lot easier just to add a sub meter uh, to a house than get a whole new electric service. And then site work, backyards are generally grass. They're generally flat, especially in Portland, there's a lot of flat, there's some hills, but it's a lot cheaper to build on a plot of grass than it is to clear a wooded lot. And nobody wants to go cut down more trees. And another thing about I mean, Portland zoning bylaw, when you go about doing this, they have protections in there for trees. So if you, so they're specifically saying don't do it. Even even it's not just a cost thing. Um, we we should be protecting that. So I guess circling back, it's it, Alexis. It's tough. Costs continue to go up as we try to as everybody tries to bring it down. Nobody wants the cost of construction to be higher. Because uh, not really anyone's be benefiting from it. Maine's getting, I mean, we produce a lot of lumber in Maine, um, but the people producing the lumber aren't making more money. They're just, they're just getting what they have and they're barely keeping up. They're, they're, their increased prices are basically going to overtime and, uh, and extra shop costs to run at, at, at breakneck, breakneck paces. So not a, not a great answer, 
Um, but there's some light in looking at uh, offsite construction and, and trying to put some downward pressure on, um, on costs. Thank you, Chris. Our next question slash questions are directed at um, Matthew. Um, we have several questions here with people asking about traditional tiny homes and tiny homes and wheels. And can you have tiny homes and wheels count as ADUs? And can you just speak a little bit towards that traditional tiny home people think of when they hear the word and how these rules affect or don't affect them? Yeah. So the way that we differentiate, and, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from a zoning perspective, and so there may be additional requirements related to the actual building permit that I'm not aware of. Um, with regards to you know, inhabited structures, all we look to see is that the structure is at a minimum built to HUD standards. Um, so you know, manufactured housing versus stick built housing is all permitted within the city. And what we're really looking at is you know, buildings that are you know, that provide basic amenities that are required for a dwelling unit and that meet our dimensional standards, you know, if they're, if they're permitted within the zone, and then they would be permitted. Um, with regards to units or, you know, tiny houses on wheels, I, unfortunately, I do not have that information on hand as to whether or not the city from a building code perspective uh, does allow for that or not. I know in some communities, they do not and they specify that and that they need a foundation. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if, if we do that or not here in, in Portland. I can, I can comment on that. So Portland and really any building department, it's all about the code. It, it's gotta be on a foundation. It's gotta be fastened to the foundation. So if there's a large microburst, it doesn't end up on its side. Um, it's gotta be connected to utilities. You, you can't, um, there's a lot of people ask about composting toilets with tiny homes all the time. They don't work great in urban areas because <laughs> if something goes wrong, given a lot of them are very safe, it's not often, but um, in an urban area, you really need to be connected to a sewer. Um, but in, for tiny homes, if it's built to code, if it's built to building code, which um, tiny homes in Maine has started building them to building code, uh, you can take the wheels off and theoretically strap it to the foundation and connect it to water sewer and, and, and have a tiny home. And we've seen, uh, there are a few towns that, that have gone as far as doing that. I think Chelsea, Maine is allowing them. Uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, way out in Western Mass, specifically passed some rules that, um, that allow people to skirt the wheels and actually park a tiny home on a pad. So they, they took that next step to try to make it possible. And it all comes back to, to just try to make an affordable living unit. That's, that's really the name of the game. Chris, a question for you. In Portland, does a detached ADU need all separate utilities or can water, power, and sewer connections be extended from the main house? Um, Good question. I, this, I think this stems into building code rather than zoning. Um, so the first one that is somewhat of a kind of a question mark because it's in flux in Portland right now. So typically when you build an accessory dwelling unit, you are connecting to the existing homes utility infrastructure for so you're connecting to a city sewer or if a septic is big enough, you're connecting to that. Now there's some question in Portland right now whether or not uh, plumbing code allows you to connect a detached ADU septic into city sewer in a basement. And we are, we are currently searching for clarity on that. And we suspect that um, Portland will probably fall in line with the surrounding communities in terms of allowing, allowing you just to connect to the sewer wherever it might be. But we're, we're trying to figure out what the exact concern is when it comes to plumbing code. As far as electric goes, generally you're gonna have one service to the property, one main line, and then an ADU is gonna go on a sub meter. Uh, how much energy you have to split between the houses really comes down to what you're using and an electrician's gonna help determine that. Uh, you, you, you don't wanna be in a situation where if you put a, a 100 amp sub panel um, off of your 100 amp 
service to your main house that all of a sudden you've got lights flickering and, and flipping main breakers that that wouldn't be good for it, for you or, or whoever's living in the ADU. And it could also be dangerous, which is more important. We don't want to be causing electrical fires. Um, and then water, generally you're going to be putting water, connecting water behind the existing water meter. So you'll have to be paying one water bill for the two units and then connecting that. And um, you can, you can kind of determine if your water service is big enough by going down to your basement and seeing, you'll be able to find the water pipe and seeing if it's a newer PEX line plastic or um, a copper line. And, um, and if it's newer, you'll generally be able to dig it. There's some, again, a little bit of uncertainty there because you got to know how many, how many dwelling units. If you're adding an ADU to a four family, you may be maxed out on your water service line. And then there's other questions that come up around split sprinklers as well. Um, that gets into life safety questions to make sure that you're not gonna, you're not gonna put your water service in a, in a position where you wouldn't be able to sprinkle a building if, if there was a fire. Um, so the, I, that probably raises more questions than it has answers. Um, but utilities are definitely doable. And I think the key thing to remember with utilities generally connecting utilities in a backyard home situation is going to be less expensive than starting from scratch on, a, on raw, raw land. I think that's the, the number one thing to keep in mind. And um, Chris, we have a follow up question, I think might be more of a yes or no question. Does the uh, do these dwellings need to comply with the main plumbing code that a single family dwelling must have five fixtures, toilet, bath or shower, kitchen sink, bathroom sink, and washing machine hookup? That's a great question. And, and I don't know the answer to that. The, all of the ADUs that we've building, that we've been building do have that, uh, just because generally the, the people who are downsizing want all of those things. But I don't know if you could drop the washer dryer connection and have less than five fixtures. So that's a good question. The other, the other interesting caveat there is if you're going to be doing an off-site built ADU uh, using modular or or something like that, uh, it's a it's it's overseen by the manufactured housing board in Maine, which has a slightly different set of rules. They've got weird variations in building code that applies, and the jurisdiction over that is is not necessarily with the, the local town. So that's a really good question. We'll have to follow up and, and check that. All right, um, question for you, Matt. Um, in the bylaw, it says each property could have up to two ADUs. Does this mean you could have two uh, small backyard homes? Absolutely, yes. So uh, we do not specify in the ordinance what form the ADUs need to take. So um, if you have a property where you where you have a sufficiently sized property, for example, and you you can still meet all of your lot coverage requirements and building setbacks, um, you are more than welcome to then build two detached uh, tiny homes in your backyard. That's awesome. <laughs> um, a question we have here is, can an ADU be a three season home or does it have to be year round? Um, whew. I guess you could live in it just three seasons, right? I mean, the zoning doesn't say you have to live there for the year round. You could go to Florida for a month. <laughs> yeah, I would add, um, for example, on Portland's islands, there are a number of seasonal homes and we do not specify in zoning that they need to be year round habitable. I guess one caveat to that would be, I don't know if the person is thinking about uh, not insulating for winter, um, but, but if you were to build an ADU, it, it would have to meet uh, building code for insulation values. You wouldn't be able to skip on that and create like a, a hunting cabin level um, house. Um, another question, um, I think this would be for Matt. Um, does the law allow for small businesses to be run out of ADUs? So it depends on the business. I mean, we do have home occupation rules in our ordinance that allow for some 
some work to occur at home. It doesn't specify in what form the home you know, must be. Um, and so if, if the business were to fall under those parameters, then yeah, they would be, it would be allowed. Uh, and again, those are generally very low impact uses. A lot of them are like, you know, tax preparation. Um, there's like a music studio uh, provision in there. There's a couple of other ones. So like, it depends on the nature of the business, but um, if it meets the home occupation rules, then, then yes, it would be permitted. And that would assume it's in the residential zone um, because you can't add ADUs in other zones that are not residential zones where residential uses are allowed. And Matt would know those more. But for instance, if you had a one of the sort of neighborhood business zones or something I'm mm -hmm. thinking of, and um, there was a mixed use building and then you added an ADU, I, I wonder, you know, if you end up how that might work. But if you get beyond the, um, you know, home occupation rules. Right. Um, we have some follow-up questions to the short-term rental question um, for you, Matt. What, what do you consider a long-term rental? Is it month to month? So I believe the long-term rental is anything beyond 30 days. I think a short-term rental is anything for less than 30 days. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting a, a nod on that. We have and, and just for folks, just to add on to that, there's a there's a whole separate section of um, of Portland's ordinances outside the land use code that deal with um, registration and, and regulation of long term rentals, and which is considered housing essentially, and short term rentals, which is Airbnb or VRBO, and um, and which is really more regulated, like like lodging to some extent, but they require different registrations. Um, and there are very specific definitions in the ordinances, but it's, I think it's outside the, the zoning code. Um, and um, there have recently been some changes, uh, at least on the long-term rental piece that I think also impacts the short-term rental piece. So it's, it's outside the zoning code, but there's a lot, a lot going on there. So, um, just for folks to be aware to uh, check with um, their, their housing staff and, and uh, licensing and permitting staff that deal with those two. Wonderful. We have another question that I think any one of you could take. Can we clarify the definition of an ADU? I'd be happy to take that if you want, Matt. It was one of the amendments that the council made um, back in November when we when we enacted it, and it is in the definition section of the uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, and uh, I'll read it. It's short and sweet. Um, accessory dwelling unit, a dwelling unit subordinate in size to the principal residential structure or structures on a lot and located either within the present uh, principal residential structure or an accessory structure. So in short, it's in the definition section of the zoning ordinance. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, just a second off that, that the person, um, I, we always get people wondering like, why don't you just increase the density? Um, it, it seems like we're bypassing density rules with these. Uh, I think the key uh, to the this may or may not have been your intent on the question, but the key is isn't the owner occupancy requirement on these. It's allowing an increase in density, but it's forcing um, an owner to continue living there, which as we've seen um, on the West Coast where they're a little bit further ahead with ADUs has had a, a natural tendency to keep rents lower if these do get rented. So owner occupied two families, owner occupied four families, and then owner occupied ADUs are likely going to have lower rents than corporate rented alternatives. Um, and then of course, if somebody lives on the property, they're probably gonna be careful about who they rent to. So it's, it's, a, it's a compromise with homeowners saying, look, let's, let's increase the density in here, but let's not do it crazy. Let, let's make the person creating the rental live with their neighbor. 
So I think that's the difference between what, what an ADU is, the definition of an ADU, and, and just saying, okay, now all single family homes are three units. That, that's true, although we um, uh, kind of split the baby a bit on, on this one. Uh, there was a lot of debate um, and the, the council at the end of the day um, decided to amend this section. And uh, what we did uh, was to require that the person, the property owner be living on the property when they apply to create an ADU. But at some point in the future, say, you know, you're living in a home, you create an ADU, your um, mother and father live there. And at some point the family wants to sell the property or wants to move and they want to rent both properties. They want to maintain um, shared ownership, right? They can maintain the ownership of the property, but they could potentially rent both in the future. So instead of uh, originally when the council got the version from the staff and the planning board, it was would have required to maintain um, uh, owner occupancy, uh, but we sort of made sure that uh, certainly you can't come in as an investor, buy a single family home, essentially scrape it or or change it so completely and create it as a three family and essentially skirt um, some of those other rules. Yeah. Um, but we also yeah. did recognize, recognize that along the way, uh, property owners, without having to do all these deed restrictions and all of that enforcement, to maintain the single ownership, but if both units end up being rentals, that would be um, allowed under our, uh, under our ordinance. Yeah, that, that was a very elegant solution for that. We, I, I, I think at this point we've read hundreds of bylaws and I've never seen it. This is the first time that someone, that a town has found a way to eliminate speculation, but not create a situation where uh, a parent dies, is no longer on the property, the thing goes into pro, like worst case scenario, and now they're, they're stuck with this thing. Um, yeah, it was very a very elegant solution for both sides of it. We worked hard on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good, it shows the, the the whole it shows across the entire bylaw. I I just it, it's absolutely fantastic how that it went through right in December. I can't believe there hasn't been more fanfare for it. To be honest, it's um I reckon I reckon hopefully hopefully we'll see all kinds of these going up in the next in the next twelve months. All right, our next question is for Matthew. Being such small projects by default, will ADUs go through a standard permitting process or is the city considering expedited permits? So as of right now, and again, I mean, it depends on, from the perspective of, of permitting, um, this actually goes through a typical building permit review at this point. So it's not looked at by planning staff, for example, with regards to site plan review. Um, so there is that, whereas previously under the, old, under the old ordinance, the requirement was that because these were conditional uses, uh, that any new proposal for an ADU would have to be reviewed by some higher authority. So usually either the planning board or the zoning board of appeals. Um, so the permitting process has been slimmed down pretty dramatically from what it was in that it is now just a standard building permit review. Um, the other piece of this is we have had inquiries on, you know, ideas for like pre-approved um, structures, essentially, that, that someone could bring in. So we, we have not approved this, and this is something that we're still in discussions on, but actually having plans that have been pre-approved for certain types of units that someone could then bring in with minimal really, and I think that would fall more under that, that expedited review process, but with very minimal over, you know, oversight and review, uh, which would really dramatically speed up review times and, and kind of that, that process to actually getting, getting it constructed. Thank you. Um, one question we have, which is, kind of going back to the um, owner occupancy is in the future, 
could you buy a single family with an existing ADU and operate both as rentals? So yes, the way the ordinance is set up is such that when you come, when you apply to construct a new accessory dwelling unit, you then would need as the as the property owner would need to either live in the accessory unit or one of the principal units on site. However, if you were to sell at that point, it would no longer be you would no longer have that requirement. So at that point in time, the new owner would be able to either maintain it as a rental unit or or rent both units out. Thank you. Just give me one moment while I scroll through and find the next question. I can jump in with one. Um, I think another good one is um, how does uh, the ADU ordinance and the construction of an ADU affect property taxes? Anyone have any thoughts on that? I can. Um move forward slightly blindly on that one. Um, so the answer is it increases your property taxes. Um, it, it certainly will do that. Um, but by how much I think is a bit of a question mark because it's probably not a lot of these that have been assessed. Um, I, I'd also would, would pander a guess that the assessing department in Portland may may or may not have a specific way that they're going to look at these yet from an assessment standpoint, because it is brand new. Um, we have seen it go in, in a couple of different ways. Uh, we have seen town assessing departments look at them as a typical in-law suite and kind of just look at it as an increased square footage and value the house with additional square footage. Uh, that would be the most advantageous way uh, probably for it to pan, pan out for taxes um, for the homeowner. But we have also seen these just get assessed as a second home if it's detached on a lot and taxed as such, um, or as a second unit. Um, so there's probably more information to come out from the city on that one as more of these get built. And I, I think uh, I, I would think that there will probably be a lot of applications going through the works this, this year, which will force an answer to that question. But the short answer is it is going to increase property taxes. But again, going back to, especially if you're doing this for a loved one, this is probably going to be the least expensive way to take care of them. Whether it's a kid who can't afford to live here, an aging parent whose alternative is buying a condo or going into a, a nursing home or an adult child with a disability who doesn't have any housing options at all, um, except for section eight and nothing that is really where you would wanna put your child. So um, not a great answer, but I think more information will probably be coming. Thank you. Um, Kim, has there been any thought to expanding this beyond residential zones to further help with short-term housing needs for homeless populations? For example, if a church in the city had land to allow for proper setbacks and such, could that be approved if they intend to house some of the city's unhoused while assisting them to connect with employment longer-term housing? So that's a fairly, um complicated scenario um, that I'm not sure, I, you know, I think Matt or myself, any of us would, would need a lot of uh, details about, about what's the zoning and, and all of that. But, but first of all, the premise is uh, important to realize that ADUs in Portland are not only allowed in our zones. They're allowed in any zone where residential use is allowed. And Matt, correct me if I'm stating that incorrectly, but that's that was certainly, that's my read. And I think that's that's how we describe it. So, and I'm seeing him nod. So in, um, I think I used an example of a neighborhood business district kind of zone. And I'm sure Matt has all of the zones off the top of his head. And hopefully within the next few years, there'll be many fewer zones in Portland when we get through uh, phase two of the recode um, and we'll have a simplified um, version of our of, of 
our code um, across the board that hopefully promotes more housing. But um, you can, if that, if the if a residential uses are allowed at this particular church property, um, then ADUs could potentially be allowed. Of course, subject to some of these other things like lot area and such. And um, I know. That, some churches are being converted uh, to and have been converted um, to um, multi-family housing. I think there's one, Williston West might be ongoing and certainly I've seen other small churches converted. There's one right near Payson Park that was converted uh, into a single family home. So, you know, church properties can uh, be reused um, in different ways, sorry kids are getting restless out there. If you hear some commotion, the natives are restless as they say this time of night. Um, so I think it would really depend on so many um, particulars of the property, but any church I would say that wants, is interested in creating housing. I know that the folks um, at the planning uh, department are eager to work with any landowner who is interested in creating housing, whether it's for those uh, supportive housing for those who might need it, who are have, have been long term stayers in in shelters or uh, who just need um, uh, you know affordable housing. Uh, that is something I know that uh, city staff is eager to work with folks on. I don't want to speak for them, but having uh, served on the council. Uh, for three years, I'm now off. Um, I know that uh, there's many people in the city eager to see more housing and are willing to uh, put the time in to help. And I, I can follow up on that a little bit. So I one thing I would say too is obviously accessory dwelling units are a niche form of housing. I mean, it's it's one tool in our toolbox that we have to increase housing supply citywide. Um, we, I will, I will note that there are already existing provisions in the code that allow for the adaptive reuse of certain institutional style buildings. So for example, a church or a school, uh, we've had examples where those buildings, if they're in an R zone, can be repurposed for housing. Um, and, and they can, and there, there are certainly options to do you know, minor expansions onto those buildings uh, in that context there. I will also say for phase two of Recode, you know, obviously this was one of those early lifts uh, in terms of policy change, we are about to embark on phase two, which is where we're go going to more comprehensively look at our land use policies, notably housing. Housing is a big one. We've received a lot of feedback on housing and a desire to see increased housing density citywide uh, and also to really promote new housing in and around our you know, neighborhood nodes and corridors across the city. Um, and so there will be certainly more, more to come on, on housing development and, and new innovative tools that really uh, get us the type of housing production that we're looking for. All right, that is wonderful. Um, we have an, a question. People are really curious about this owner occupancy and making sure that there can be um, lots of ways to rent these homes. One of the questions is, is there a requirement on how long the owner needs to own the property before selling after an ADU is approved? Put another way, is there anything preventing someone from flipping properties by installing ADUs and immediately selling? So I think the answer to that is no. I, I think you are able to, you know, at time of construction, you would need to provide some evidence documentation that you are in fact the property owner that you will be still living on site. But once the approval is issued and the unit is, construct is constructed and occupied, you know, thereafter, there is no requirement for a deed restriction. Um, there's nothing baked into the ordinance that would say, you know, you need to live here for three months, six months, a year. Um, and so theoretically, yeah, you could, you could sell the unit immediately after the, the accessory unit was occupied. And I'll, I'll follow up on that. Cause I, I mean, that, I always like to think about the, the intent, what was somebody thinking on the question and they were either thinking, can they go and do this and buy and live in it and sell it? Or they were thinking that it was a, a hole in the, the bylaw and cause speculation. So 
I, I've done a, some small real estate investing and just from what I've seen in that space, it that that owner occupancy requirement is going to be enough of a wall to prevent big developers from getting involved in ADU speculation. Um, the fact that you can build two of these does change that a little bit because it, it does sweeten the deal for somebody uh, who wants to come in and buy a single family home and create three units out of it, units out of it. Um, but the other piece that that Portland did to prevent speculation on this realm is said that they can't be condoized, which if they hadn't done that, yes, a developer would 110% start buying single family homes, sit in them for a week, and then build three units and sell them as condos for $350,000 a piece or whatever the heck the going rate for a condo is. But I think between those two pieces, um, it, it's going to prevent speculation and the benefit of not having that deed restriction and not having a special permit is that uh, homeowners are going to have more access to residential financing to build these. Um, banks have been traditionally uh, not comfortable lending for ADUs when there's a special permit associated with it or if there's an owner occupancy requirement, because there's not, um, it's a weird thing. The, the appraiser doesn't know how to appraise it, which means a bank can't get their loan to value ratios and they don't have their collateral, um, which means you can't get a construction loan based on the post completion value of the project. So I personally, I think I think the the balance is, is really quite perfect with, with what Portland did with this. Um, and. The, and if someone does try to speculate with it, the, the person that's going to speculate is going to be someone early in their real estate investment career. It's going to be someone that's possibly playing with an FHA loan who is probably not making a whole lot of money. Um, they're, they're probably just getting started out. And it's probably the kind of person that we that we would like to uh, get a piece of uh, would, would, that we'd like to develop housing and make a little bit of profit from it. So, yeah, I, I think it's great. I, I think it's a really good marriage of two parts of that that bylaw. Uh, Chris, would you speak to some of the data that we're seeing coming from the West Coast on um, rents being uh, less expensive when the owner lives on the same property as the renter. Yeah, I, I've said that a few times and I, I try to harp the point whenever people are, are talking about these because it's such a benefit. So um, the other Portland, uh, Portland, Oregon, the, the bigger version, um, did a, uh, they did a really big survey a couple of years ago, but Portland, Oregon has been a pioneer in ADUs led by a guy named um, Cole Peterson. Uh, really, it's been a six or seven year quest for them. And they started long enough ago where they were able to survey a few thousand, I think it was, it was over a thousand homeowners who had built this. And because rents in Portland, Oregon are, I think they're even higher than, than Portland, Maine, um, it made more sense for homeowners to build these as rentals. And they did see that in a handshake transaction between neighbors, a property owner and someone renting their ADU, um, that the rents were lower than your other non-owner occupied unit. And again, in Portland, you don't have to be owner occupied forever, but it's probably gonna be the case that most of these get built and the owner occupancy remains for, for quite some time. Um, and the, the, the other neat piece about this is a lot, of, a lot of ADUs are newly constructed, which means it's probably a premium rental unit, but they're still renting at a discount without a deed restriction, which is, which is exactly what these rules are supposed to be doing. And, and this, 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 uh, this also applies to just owner-occupied two units, owner-occupied three units. Generally, you're seeing someone who's living in there uh, just charging less rent whether it's because they want a nice neighbor, but, but I just think it comes down to when you have to knock on someone's door, shake their hand and take their money, 
and looked them in the eye, you're not going to gouge them. But if you're just collecting checks and never have to interact, you're, you're going to charge what the market is um, because you because you can and you don't have to see the 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 implications of that. Thank you. Um, I would just like to draw attention to the fact that we have gone over by 10 minutes um, and understand that some people may need to leave. We are able to stick around for a few more questions, um, but we have reached the end of our scheduled time. Just scrolling through. Um, are the ADUs required to tie into plumbing and electric or can they be off grid? I, I guess I could run with that one. So we've kind of answered this in different ways. Uh, you can definitely build an off-grid ADU. Uh, solar and battery backup systems do exist. Um, I don't think you're going to be drilling a well in, in downtown Portland. I don't think you necessarily want to. I'm not sure if you're allowed to. Um, but the, the big one comes down to septic. If you're out in, in some of the more spread out areas that are not served by city sewer, uh, you could potentially be fully off-grid um, with a approved septic system. Um, but if the question is again going to use of composting toilets and different toilet technology, um, generally you're probably going to still need to do a leach field uh, to handle gray water for the unit. But yeah, you can you can totally go out. You can, there are ways to get completely off grid. I don't know if it's feasible in downtown Portland or the urban areas, but uh, it, it's certainly possible. All right, it looks like the remainder of our questions are all um, very, they, they're, they're just kind of repetitive on things that we've already covered or questions that have been answered just kind of as a byproduct of you answering other questions. Um, if anybody has any last minute questions they'd like to throw into the q and I'd love to see those. Um, otherwise, I think we have answered all of our questions. Is there anything that uh, any of you panelists would like to touch on before we end this evening? Thanks for including me. Thank you for coming. This, was, this has been great. Um, I personally couldn't think of a better way to get welcome back to Maine. Left for three years, came, came back and Got to see the ADU, ADU rules and a red carpet to, uh, uh, to ADU laws. And again, the best bylaw really in the country. <laughs> so what a, what a great way to kick off the year. Um, and I'd say thank you to, to Kara Wilbur too for getting Yimmy involved. I know that everything that they've done has been just enormous uh, in, in helping get this through and making sure that the voice of homeowners were in there. Um, and then I did see some people posting in the, uh, in the chat, um, why weren't there more Maine companies in here, specifically tiny homes of Maine? Um, when I am a Maine company, we did start in Massachusetts, but we, we are based out of Brunswick, Maine. Um, that was uh, just happened to be where we lived. But tiny homes of Maine, Corinne has, has, has been leading the way for tiny homes and she even got state legislation through to make those possible. Um, I, I do suspect that we'll probably be doing events with her in the future um, because she is the, the main expert on tiny homes on wheels. Uh, and I, I, think, I think she's working on some stuff now to be able to serve um, tiny homes that, that are legal, like less than 400 square foot factory built homes that can go in backyards in Portland, which would be, which would be great. There's, there's more than every, there's a lot of people who need this and the more people helping build them, the better. Um, and then finally, I think what we're going to do, uh, I did say at the beginning of the call that we we're going to do a, uh, a live property evaluation. Um, we've had a lot of people drop off at this point. So I think what we're going to do just in fairness, to everyone's time is do a follow up session and we'll do us we'll specifically do a workshop that will be focused on evaluating five to 10 properties um, instead of trying to push into 7.30 tonight uh, to do that. So everyone keep an eye 
on your emails. We'll be following up with a follow-up link. That comp the competition still stands. If you think you know how many uh, properties, how many units um, the property I mentioned earlier can have, uh, shoot us an email. Um, I, I don't, can't, Alexis, did you see anybody put in the chat um, a unit count? A uh, unit count for? Uh, for that property uh, for 23 no. Street? I did not. Okay, so if anyone did go through the motions of trying to figure out how many units 23 Pitt Street can have in a perfect oh. world, um, send us an email, uh, info at backyardadus.com, um, and we will stand by that, that sweatshirt giveaway. It's a really sweet uh, black Carhartt um, that, will, that will send your way. So anyway. we, we just had two put in the chat. We have uh, two guesses at two all right you're both wrong <laughs> it's more than that so oh, oh, chris miller is seven. All, chris miller is a lot closer but I, I still think it's not quite right so if you have if you if you have more guesses send them to info at backyard uh, info at backyard adus and uh, we'll be in touch if you get it right and if no one gets it right we'll we'll follow up on that at the workshop where we do property valuations. Cheryl Piker has said four units. Nah, nope. All right, so we've, we're, we're gonna do like process of elimination, but all right, we gotta stop before we eliminate all the uh, one through tens. <laughs> all right, thank you everyone. Thank you, thank you, Kim, thank you, Carrie, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Alexis. This has been absolutely fantastic, fantastic, and we look forward to seeing if Portland can lead the way in New England for a number of ADUs built, I, I think they can. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you.